nitrogen production is based upon the Haber-Bosch process, which is an energy intensive process using natural gas. And if we're going to be exporting natural gas, eventually what's going to happen is natural gas prices are going to go up, which means that nitrogen prices are going to go up as well. And then, of course, erosion is carrying nitrogen and phosphorus and it's polluting to the environment. So, you know, our solution is to find hopefully a perennial crop that is going to provide inexpensive nitrogen and also stabilize the soil. So the things that we've done till date uh, up until now is that, you know, we've looked at some establishment practices and I want to talk to you, I won't talk about the clover seeding rate, but I'll talk to you about tillage systems and how that impacts establishment and show you some pictures. Uh, we've looked at the nitrogen contribution from the clover to the corn crop and I, I uh, want to um, uh, show you uh, some graphs on that. We've done some studies on nitrogen replacement by clover. Uh, that's a kind of a classical way of looking at this. I'm not going to share that data, but, but I also want to show you that there's an additive effect from year to year as you go from having clover established one year to having clover established a second year. And it's actually a pretty dramatic effect. So I'll show you some pictures and share some information with you. On that. Uh, so that was something that we did originally. Uh, our second phase was then to take a look at the agronomic practices of uh, how we might optimize this system. So that means um, looking at row spacing, herbicide banding, population density uh, of the corn, uh, and some of the more fundamental agronomic uh, practices that we would have to follow in order to keep this system and make this system maintain itself. Because what we want to do is we want to grow a corn crop and then have uh, the clover reestablish itself and, and provide the ground cover and, and uh, the nitrogen for the following year. So we've done some of that work, and then um, and then uh, uh, we've we've got a problem at the end of our summer down here with some annual weeds. So we're using livestock uh, to remove the corn residue, and then also control our late season weeds so that the clover can regrow and and reestablish itself over the course of the winter time. And then finally, uh, I want to share with you some of the environmental impacts of the living mulch system. I know there's people from NRCS in the audience up there, and this is really encouraging work, or encouraging work and basically it's telling us that uh, this is one of those rare moments where farmers are going to win and environmentalists are going to win at the same time. So everybody's happy about this, and the, and the corn producers that I work with down here um, I get funding from the Corn Commission in the state here. We also have some USDA funding for this. And, uh, and so far, everybody's really happy with what we're seeing. So, um, you know, just kind of a primer as to what's coming ahead. One of the problems that we have here in Georgia is that uh, uh, we have a rainfall deficit for about eight months out of the year. Um, and, and the black line here that you see is... Um, um, is what we call pan evaporation. This is what it takes to, uh, or this is if you were to, uh, let me explain this here. Uh, if you were to um, uh, just put a pan of water out in an open field, this is the rate of evaporation in terms of inches per month. So you can look at June and July, for example, and we're over six inches a month in August also. We're over six inches a month of evaporation off the soil surface. The red line there represents uh, the amount of rainfall that we get. And we have fairly uniform rainfall except for, you know, September and October. But, um, but the rainfall does not meet the uh, evaporative demand. And then if you factor in on top of that, that you have a growing crop that is increasing its water needs based upon the leaf area that it's producing. You know, we have a rainfall deficit during our corn production season down here. So everything we do is using irrigation. And in fact, in South Georgia, there's kind of this running joke that you we're always three days away from a, from a drought. Uh, they have sandy soils down there and not a whole lot of water holding capacity. 
So the first phase of the study that I want to talk about is, you know, some work that we've done with uh, corn establishment. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about herbicide ef efficacy. We've got that pretty much figured out. Um, but I want to look at nitrogen availability uh, in this uh, clover and uh, corn binary mixture. So the tillage systems that we used were, you know, a conventional tillage, um, no-till directly into the clover, the clover tilled, and then uh, using conventional methods incorporating the, the corn into the clover. We band spray uh, the clover and, and create dead zones and then no-till into those dead bands. And then we also band sprayed uh, and strip tilled this, uh, um, the dead zones to incorporate the residue into the soil, which is a very common practice here in Georgia. And then we, uh, we, we plant directly into the stripped areas. So this work was done at two different locations um, in, in uh, uh, Floyd County, which is northern Georgia, and Tifton, which is in southern Georgia. Um, and the second thing we wanted to do was look at the nitrogen contribution from the clover uh, to the crop. And, and um, basically what we did is we tricked the system into trying to release more nitrogen and we could monitor the nitrogen uptake by the corn and availability in the soil and uh, estimate from that, get an estimate of what we're uh, getting in terms of contribution. So here's what our tillage treatments look like. Um, uh, right in the front here, uh, you can see this has been banded. This is herbicide death right here. Um, and we would plant directly into that. Over here, you can see the soil has been worked. That's strip tilled. Um, this is, you can't see the clover very well here, but there's actually little tiny bits of clover exposed on the surface. This has been turned and then the ground prepared and we're going to plant into it. And here's our conventional system. There was no uh, clover in there whatsoever, and we just turned the soil, and we're going to plant into that. So if you look at uh, no tillage directly into clover, here's what you see. I mean, we've got tiny little plants. We've got a poor stand. Um, we really uh, – uh, I knew this was going to happen based upon some of the work that I've seen in the past, but uh, – we wanted to demonstrate to producers that you don't want to do this because this is the first thing that people asked was, wow, can I just no-till directly into the clover? And the answer is no. So then the other question is, can you turn the clover and then plant it uh, and, and hopefully wind up with good corn and good clover together? Uh, you can see the difference in the clover that's uh, present on the soil surface here but you can also see that we don't have a very good stand of corn. And actually that clover grows, regrows pretty quickly and, uh, and competes with the corn for nutrients and moisture early in the corn's life cycle. So that didn't work either. Um, uh, here's a no-till uh, treatment on the left here. And this is uh, where we've banded with herbicide and planted directly into the bands with no-till and you can just see the difference in the corn so you know we know that we need to band uh, herbicide or, or band herbicides to kill corn in strips and then plant into those dead strips. Um, th this is me I know you can't see me I'm not trying to I'm not trying to be Hollywood here or anything like that but we found a very interesting response um, in North Georgia. This is up in uh, Floyd County. You can see the mountains in the background, what we refer to as mountains anyhow. <laughs> but, but this is a, uh, uh, a plot that was conventional tilled. And what happened is that we have a tremendous crow population in North Georgia. And the crows came in into the prepared areas and they picked up the corn at the seedling stage and just laid it over and took the seed that was on the bottom of the corn plant and ate it. And just, I mean, they laid corn over, it looked like uh, a railroad track, you know, the cross ties. They were so perfect at laying that over and just leaving the corn there. But you can see in the living mulch area right next to it here, uh, they did not get into it. They did 
not get into it here. You can see these are, this is a no-till treatment back here, but you can see they didn't get into anywhere that where the clover was growing. So this is what we refer to as an ecosystem service in the scientific world. Not that that's really what we're interested in this particular case, other than, you know, we got protection from the crows because they don't like to go in where there's some habitat for little creepy crawly things that might attack them. So if you look at our uh, corn establishment, now this is just uh, going in and, and counting plants when they're very young. Um, and so um, this is our conventional treatment down here in Floyd County and in Tifton. And these, these uh, lines that I have in red and these treatments that I have in red, the statistically speaking, the, the uh, establishment of the corn was the same in those systems as it was in the conventional system uh, where we had no clover. And it was consistent at both locations of Floyd County and Tifton. Uh, conventional uh, conventional tillage where we tilled the clover under suppressed the population density and as well as did no-till into the clover. So this is telling us that we need to do some kind of uh, killing of strips of the clover and really that's something that we like because it's going when we kill the clover the nitrogen gets released from the uh, organic matter that's dead mm -hmm. and uh, gives some starter fertilizer for the corn crop. So the second thing we wanted to do then was we wanted to look at the nitrogen contribution from the clover to the corn crop. And um, uh, we used a conventional tillage system and I've got this expressed as kilograms per hectare of nitrogen, but this could also be viewed as pounds per acre of nitrogen. Um, and we used the living mulch system where we band killed uh, the, the clover and no-till directly in. Um, then we also looked at some, uh, some uh, treatments where we suppressed the clover at the time of planting um, at seven days, 14 days after planting. We had another plot where we did not suppress the clover. Um, uh, we, soiled, we sampled the soil and analyzed the soil for available nitrates and we sampled the corn and analyzed the corn for nitrogen. And from this, we could determine the amount of nitrogen which was available and the amount of nitrogen which was taken up by the corn crop. Uh, let me back up for a second. So this is, uh, just gives you an idea of, uh, this is not that experiment, this is a sister experiment, but I just wanted to show you this. If you suppress the clover at different times during the growing season, so this is clover right here has not been suppressed at all. This was suppressed um, uh, at the same time of planting. Uh, this one over, well, I guess this one over here was 14 days after planting, and that one there was 21 days after planting. And actually what happened was that, you know, the, uh, we suppressed with a light rate of, uh, of, of um, Roundup. And, and a combination of heat and, and stress by the um, uh, herbicide. If, if, we, if we did this too late into the growing season, the heat came in and it basically um, uh, gave us a problem with uh, clover regrowth. A combination of heat stress and herbicide stress gave us this issue here. So if you look at uh, the amount of nitrogen which was taken up by uh, the corn plant, this is, if we were to, yeah, this is the amount of nitrogen which became available and uh, was uh, taken up by the corn plant in the living <laughs> system. And if you look at this red dotted line here, this is if we killed clover seven days before planting, this is the amount of nitrogen which was released uh, uh, as a result of um, of uh, banding the the herbicide on the on the clover, uh, if we suppress the clover with glyphosate or Roundup at planting, we got a, a some additional nitrogen. But what was interesting is that the primary source of nitrogen that was becoming available to the corn crop was from uh, senescence or leaf drop uh, as the corn crop grew. So basically what happened is the corn crop grew, uh, the clover underneath is getting shaded, 
And as a response to the shading, the clover drops its leaves, and, uh, and those leaves then provide an opportunity for uh, nitrogen to uh, be released and uh, become available to the, the corn crop. So this uh, is the nitrogen availability for the corn crop. If we were to fertilize with 250 pounds to the acre of nitrogen, this is what the uptake uh, would be. And you can see 180 pounds of nitrogen uptake. So we've got 70 pounds that are in the environment someplace. And here we're getting about 160 pounds of uh, nitrogen uptake. Uh, the yield on these, uh, the, the 250 pounds of nitrogen uh, was about 170 bushels to the acre. And surprisingly, even though there's less nitrogen in the corn, the, uh, the yield for the um, uh, living mulch system was about 200 bushels to the acre. So we had a little bit better yield in the, in the uh, uh, living mulch system. Okay, all of this has been done on 30-inch rows. And, and that's, you know, we just assume that that would be a good treatment because that's what a lot of our corn production is, is based upon. Nick, could you go back real quick to that slide? I got a quick question about I'm trying to understand. So the darker uh, dotted line, that's total end uptake by the, by the, uh, by the corn plant. The corn plant, which corn plant, which which and, treatment? And the living mulch system. The living mulch system that was suppressed when? Uh, that was the the clover was killed seven days before planting. Okay, so it was killed outright or it was suppressed? Well, it was banded. So okay, we, banded. Okay. Got yeah, it. yeah. Okay, so the nitrogen, you know, fertilized or the the nitrogen <laughs> that was coming from the dead clover is taken up plus any residual nitrogen that might have been in the soil. So, um, and then this dark, darker red line here, that is that which is coming from the senescence. So you can see that, you know, about 40 days, 30 or 40 days after planting, we start seeing this release of nitrogen uh, as a result of senescence from the, from the clover. Did you say that you did any side dress with the band killed? Uh clover or is that no side dress whatsoever this is just strictly nitrogen from the clover okay okay um this was something that we did we wanted to determine whether there was any kind of an additive effect due to the clover age and uh so this is kind of a progression that you see here the the far left picture is my research technician He's standing in clover that is two years old. It was killed in bands, no till uh, into the dead zones, no nitrogen application whatsoever. That, that second from the left is two year old clover where we no till directly into the clover, no nitrogen. Um, it, what I think is interesting to note here is that you don't see the same ear development <sighs> that you see over here uh, where we had killed in the band. This is one-year-old clover, uh, and you can see the ears are developing here, um, uh, but the difference between this one and this one is just one year's age difference in the clover. So, you know, we're seeing an additive effect. If we can get that clover to regrow, this, this is what we see, okay? And then this is one-year-old clover. You can see the amount of clover in there is a lot of clover, but uh, it was no-till directly into it. And just like we saw previously, we didn't get very good uh, uh, corn growth out of that. If uh, I pulled ears from each one of those treatments and uh, put them on the tailgate of the truck and took this picture, and uh, you can see, you know, the progression's about the same as the picture. The ears are larger in uh, in the corn crop that we have uh, band sprayed and it doesn't really matter whether it's one-year-old corn or two-year-old corn if we put a band herbicide band on the clover to establish the corn into we get better corn production than if uh, we had not so um, you know just wanted to wanted to show that picture so you can see that there is an impact on the growth and development of the corn okay so everything was done in 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 uh, 30 inch rows uh, we really didn't have good control on our banding application. Um, uh, 
Uh, we've since purchased a, a hooded sprayer that we can control how wide of a spray pattern we have. Uh, and our hooded sprayer, we can adjust the width of the of the hoods as well. So, uh, so now what we want to do, or what we have done, is we've gone back and we've uh, con conducted some experiments where we're now optimizing this relationship between the corn and the white clover, looking at different banding patterns with herbicide and different row patterns and population densities as well. Nick, did you say that your the herbicide that you used for the banding was glyphosate? I know that that's what you suppressed it with uh, generally, but did you just use a higher rate to kill it in the band or did you? No, actually, I'm sorry that it, we use a combination of Banvil and, uh, and Roundup. Okay. Uh, um, Banvil to control the clover, Clover is actually quite tolerant of Roundup, especially early in the season. Yep. Um, I was working with some dairy farmers that had some clover in uh, growing in some of their pastures, and uh, and uh, I wanted to kill the clover to do some experiments. and uh, And this particular clover is one called Durana. Uh, it's an ecotype out of Georgia. It's not even a variety per se, um, but. Uh, uh, I put two pounds of Roundup on that clover that was growing in those dairy farms, and it grew back. Um, so um, but we have to use Banville, you know, a broadleaf uh, herbicide in order to kill the clover. Okay. So this picture here uh, is kind of what we like to see. You know, you can look at here's the organic matter laying on the soil surface. Uh, uh, this is releasing its nutrients. You know, the corn is looking pretty good here. We've got a great population of clover in between the rows. And as the corn grows, it'll shade this clover and this clover will start dropping its leaves. And actually right now, as you see this picture, is about when we're getting canopy closure on the uh, uh, clover and it's starting to drop its leaves. So our objective is just to determine the object optimum agronomic practices that lend to the perpetuation of a living mulch system. So remember, we're, we don't just want to grow corn, but we want to have the clover regrow at the end of the growing season. So we did this at two different locations, uh, Floyd County, which again is up in the, in the mountainous region of Georgia, and then at J. Phil Campbell Research Farm, which is located here close to campus in the Athens area. It's still uh, in northern Georgia, but uh, not as far north as Floyd County is. And we did it at these experiments, or at these locations, so that uh, we could really do some intensive work on it. It's not too far for us to drive to Floyd County, uh, and but we have some very detailed work that we're looking at, the relationship between the corn and the clover. So it takes weekly observations, and if you're doing it at two different locations, you don't want to be driving four hours in one direction down to South Georgia so that you can uh, uh, spend all day taking measurements and then drive four hours back. Um, so the corn spacings that we had were 30-inch and 36-inch rows. I've got them in centimeters here. The herbicide bandwidths were 8 inches and 16 inches. Um, we used two different population densities, uh, 24,000 and 36,000 plants to the acre. And then we conducted this over two years in 2014 and 2015. Uh, what we do is uh, once we get our kill and we have our uh, corn planted and it's germinated, when it's at the spike stage, we come back and we apply a combination of atrazine and prowl for in-row control only. We don't broadcast this, but we just go right back over the row where we have sprayed to kill the clover uh, and then, and then uh, uh, assume that that's going to give us good uh, weed control, which it does. And then we irrigate to keep the uh, uh, soil moisture content between 40 and 90 percent of the available soil water. Um, so if you think back to your soil science days, you know, uh, this is basically, um, uh, we don't want to let it get down to the wilting point. Uh, when you get to the wilting point, basically what's happening is you're already stressing your corn plant. So we want to keep the corn plant out of stress as much as possible. So you're basically, for the wilting point, you're talking about just visibly seeing the corn roll, roll its leaves up a little bit, then you're 
Well, that would be that would be incip incipient wilt, but we don't like that. We try and avoid that if we can. So, so you're, you're not even getting to that point. No, and okay. we have we have soil moisture sensors in there, and when it's time to irrigate, we irrigate. So, um, so we look at corn height. Then uh, this is Allie Hintz, my undergraduate student, just measuring corn corn height. She's also looking at light interception, and we take measurements of light above the corn canopy and then down at the bottom of the corn canopy. And then we measure clover mass. We use a little technique called a uh, rising plate meter, and we can calibrate that. Basically, it falls on top of the clover, and the resistance of the clover pushes this little plastic disc up. And we can calibrate the height at which this the clover keeps the disc off of the soil surface and that's um, uh, r that relationship exists between clover mass and, and the height that it's up off the ground uh, and then we harvest it at 25 percent moisture we remove all the stalks in this particular case uh, and I'll show you why we do that here in just a little bit but it's critical to remove the corn stover uh, in order to let the clover regrow. If you've got stover sitting back on top of that clover, the clover's not going to regrow. Uh, so we remove the corn stalks and we come in and we, play, we apply either fusillate or holon to control late season annual weed, uh, annual grass weeds. We don't have a problem too much with broadleaves, but we do with uh, annual grasses. So here's just a, an example of, uh, this is a, uh, an eight inch band uh, uh, that the clover is planted into. And you can see the clover now is, it's actually, uh, this is about 30 days old. The clover is already starting to grow, or maybe it's a, not about 20 days old. The clover is reestablishing itself back into these dead zones that the, we planted the corn into. So we don't think we can go any more narrow than eight inches, but, um, but eight inches looks nice. Here's 16 inches, uh, and you can see that there's a wider band there. This just means more weed potential in here. Uh, and, and I'll be honest with you, I like the eight inch application rather than the 16, ap 16 inch application for a variety of reasons, which will become evident. Uh, here's differences in corn development. Uh, this is the eight inch band and you can see here the corn is kind of yellow compared to over here where we had a 16 inch band. Basically what's happening is that we have more uh, nitrogen being released in the 16 inch band at the time of kill um, uh, before planting than we do at the eight inch band. But, and that continues throughout the life of the corn up until the corn tassels. The, the height between the two when it's tasseling is no different, but, uh, but what's happening here, you can see the, the initial nitrogen from the corn or from the release from the clover gives us more corn growth. Right here, what's happening is that the, the clover underneath there is starting to drop its leaves and releasing more nitrogen. And eventually what's going to happen is that this is going to catch up to this treatment here and, uh, and there won't be any yield difference between the two. And uh, so at the end of the summer, this is kind of what we see. The clover, you can see it's kind of hanging on underneath there. It's not really flowering or it's not very robust. Uh, you can see a little, that's a crabgrass plant right there. There's another one back there. And that's what our enemy is uh, because crabgrass at the end of our summer, we're still 90 degrees, you know, in the middle of uh, September and clo or the crabgrass loves that and it will just take over the clover if we're not careful. Okay, so here's uh, what some of the yields are. Uh, a 30 inch band, or I'm sorry, 30 inch row spacing, eight inch band, 36,000 plants to the acre. You know, we're all, regardless of, of treatment here, at these population densities, we're at about, you know, 220, 225 bushels to the acre. If you drop the population density down to 24,000, uh, this is what happens here. We, we lose some yield, but not too that, bad. Is that with some side dress or is that still without side dress? Straight, straight clover. No side dress nitrogen whatsoever. Hmm. Wow. Pretty exciting, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So uh, 
you know, we're looking at, um, so that was up in Floyd County. Here's in Watkinsville uh, at the J. Phil Campbell Farm, which is close to campus here. Uh, the soils here aren't as quite as good as they are up uh, in the northern part of the country. But again, you know, yields are 180 to 200 bushels to the acre. Um, my favorite treatment right here actually in this first year had lower yield than um, uh, in subsequent years. So uh, in this particular case, you know, this doesn't look quite so good. But you're going to see as we go through this next uh, set of slides that shows you clover reestablishment after harvest. Okay, so here we are. <coughs> this is a 30 inch row with an eight inch band, 28 days after harvest. Here it is 56 days after harvest and look at the clover regrowth. I mean, we basically have got 100% clover recovery there. Uh, here's a 36 inch row with an <coughs> eight inch band. And again, you know, 56 days after harvest, we basically have 100% recovery of the clover. Here's a 30 inch row with a 16 inch band, uh, you know, 28 days after harvest and then 56 days after harvest. And this particular treatment is in real trouble because we can't get the clover to regrow. We come back in the next year, you know, we're yielding really, really low. So, um, so this is not really an option. I don't even have to show you the yield date on this. It's really pretty low. And here's a 36 inch uh, uh, row of corn with a 16 inch band. And you can see even it is not uh, recovering the way we would like to see it recover. So the eight inch band is, is critical for perpetuation of the system. Uh, here's just what happens. It's kind of interesting. Light interception, uh, it's not a whole lot of difference among the treatments, but we know that about 40 days after uh, uh, after planting, the corn is getting tall now. We're starting to see uh, a lot of light interception. This is also when we're going to start seeing the clover being suppressed about 40 days after it grows. So this is where the shading is occurring. Okay, here's the amount of clover under each one of those treatments. So here's a 36-inch row with an 8-inch band. We have a lot of clover standing out in the field. Okay, that's going to be releasing its nitrogen as shading goes on. Here's a 30 inch row with an eight inch band, a 36 inch row with a 16 inch band, and a 30 inch row with a 16 inch band. So the, the width of the band, basically, you're sacrificing late season clover contribution, to early season clover contribution. And, uh, and it's the late season, it seems to be the best for us. So, uh, so we have Shading occurring here, you can see that the clover mass is dropping. Um, but you know, out here, this is a little bit right at tasseling here. We've got more clover in the narrow bands, and consequently, that's what we like to see because we're go still going to go through about a month of uh, shading, and that clover needs to be healthy uh, at the time of tasseling. So this is what we're seeing is that the, the eight inch band gives us healthier, um, uh, healthier uh, um, clover plants. Here's the nitrogen that's released. And uh, so here's a, the, the one that gives us the greatest amount later in the season is uh, this 36 inch row with the eight inch band. Here's the shading. And this is when we start seeing that release of nitrogen. So this at 40 days, you know, is about probably the eight or nine leaf stage, be V8 or V9, something like that. And we're really getting a contribution of nitrogen as a result of those narrow bands, whereas the wider bands we don't see as much. And I think this is really more critical from the standpoint of growing the corn than it is in early season back here. Okay, so just another picture showing uh, the eight inch clover uh, uh, kill versus the 16 inch clover kill. Uh, differences in corn height as we go through the growing season. Okay, now here we have uh, the, the recovery of the clover and this is over a two year period. And uh, so, uh, this is 2014, 2015. This black line here is our 36 inch row with our eight inch band. 
This is our 30 inch row with an eight inch band and you can see the 16 inch bands, we don't get as much recovery. In 2015 and 2016, it's interesting that, you know, the 30 inch, or I'm sorry, 36 inch row with an eight inch band still is our best. Um, but the, the 30 inch row, now we're starting to see an impact of, you know, there's basically from a geometrical standpoint, more clover getting killed with an eight inch band on a 30 inch row than on a 36 inch row. So we're starting to see this decrease in the amount of uh, clover and its ability to recover at the end of the growing season. Um, we're starting to come back up. This is this was taken uh, two weeks ago. We went through a really cold period between uh, uh, about the first of January and middle of February, and the clover kind of shrank. It um, got frosted and and uh, kind of shrank, but it's starting to come back up again now. We'll be ready to go come April when we're going to plant again. Nick, I got a good question. Um, so you you put a broadleaf herbicide in when you killed the bands. Have you ever tried it where you just put glyphosate that kind of sets it back but doesn't doesn't have as much activity against it to see if you can get quicker rebounding? Um, well, we can probably do that. I just don't like having clover in there because it's a very aggressive plant when the corn is at the seedling stage. Right. And, uh, and it's going to compete for both water and, and nutrients. And, uh, and actually, I've seen it to where it can cover up the corn crop in some of the no-till treatments that we've had. So I don't want to have any competition as much as I can possibly avoid okay. uh, using this system. So, so you know, 36-inch row, 8-inch band gives us our best results year after year. Uh, you know, in Floyd County, this is up in North Georgia now in the mountain area. First year, pretty had, had pretty good regrowth regardless of uh, what the treatments were. But this is interesting. In 2015, 2016, look at the regrowth that we have here. And what we do in Floyd County to remove the stover is at the end of harvest, we go through there and we mow everything and rake it and bale it. Well, this year we mowed it, and then we had about a six-week uh, weather pattern come in, and we could not get back into the field. We couldn't get the corn dry, and then we couldn't get back into the field to mow it anyhow. Mm -hmm. So um, so what you're seeing here is the impact of the corn residue sitting on top of that clover. Nothing regrew as a result of that. And so you know, stover removal is going to be critical as, in terms of perpetuating this system. So uh, that brings us to the next section of the, of the project then, and that's what I call phase three. And this is the environmental impacts of the no-till uh, and living mulch corn production system using matched watersheds. And so when I say no-till, uh, I'm talking about using cereal rye. That's our conventional uh, cover crop that we use down here. So we have a cereal rye cover crop, and we compare the living mulch cover crop, and we use watersheds to do this study. So um, uh, I, I know we're getting ready for lunch, so I'm going to go through this. So the watersheds that we used, uh, they're, they're matched because they're similar in size. They also have a similar slope. They have the same soil type. And if you go back and you look at historically the uh, runoff from the, P th from the two watersheds, P3, even though it's got a 3% slope and it's actually a little bit smaller, uh, historically has had more water runoff than P4. And, um, you know, the slope is the average over the entire watershed area. And there's actually a little region in the P3 where there's kind of a gully and water runs off more rapidly in that gully than it does in, than in P4, which does not have a gully. So we get more water runoff and we also get more soil erosion from uh, the P3 versus P4 when we have it in, in just a system where there's no cover crop on it at all. And we can go back to historical data, you know, where we have data from 10 years or more in each one of these watersheds looking at either water runoff or soil erosion. So here's the P3 right here. And because we get more erosion on this, we purposely planted this to the living mulch system 
because we wanted to find out whether we could get a benefit, an added benefit, uh, and and reduce the amount of runoff relative to P4, even because we know that we're going to get more, and uh, and also see if we couldn't reduce the amount of sediment coming off of P3 because we know we would normally get more off of this. So you know the the way we handled these two systems. Uh, in October of 2014, we planted our, our clover in the in living mulch system. In November, we planted cereal rye. Uh, we killed the cover crop uh, in bands, 36 inch. We plant the corn in 36 inch rows. We uh, put an eight inch band of herbicide April 1 to kill the clover. Um, and then we came in March 21 to kill the, the cereal rye. Uh, that's because the rye gets up pretty tall and we don't want to have too much residue out there because it becomes hard to plant if, if we have that occurring. We planted our corn on April 14th. Uh, we applied herbicides over the corn at the spike stage. Again, this is uh, atrazine and prowl. It was banded in the living mulch system but broadcast in the cereal rye. No nitrogen fertilization in the living mulch system. Uh, 285 pounds of the acre of uh, nitrogen in the cereal rye, 65 pounds, or I'm sorry, 60 pounds at planting, and then 225 pounds at the V5 stage. Irrigated again, you know, to keep it uh, uh, in good soil moisture content, and then we harvested these in uh, on September 14th. Okay. When we harvested them, we came in and we grazed the watersheds. Uh, so we divided the watersheds into four paddocks each. We put in pregnant heifers. They were 400, about 900 pound animals, uh, six of them in each watershed. And then we grazed the different paddocks sequentially over a 28 day period. So here's what it looks like. Uh, you can see here's our corn rows right there. You, there's uh, a volunteer corn growing up there. Um, uh, uh, we also had some morning glory and a couple of other uh, uh, annual weeds growing in here. But when we put the cattle in there, you can see here's the regrowth uh, uh, afterwards. And you don't see these rows in here. So they do a pretty good job of controlling the weeds. And you can see that the stover, uh, there's nothing laying on the surface after uh, the animals have gone through and grazed. So we graze this pretty heavily and get it grazed down. Okay, so uh, we've got H flumes in these watersheds, which is just a, a system that we can monitor the amount of water that's running off. We have water samplers there and flow meters that can um, uh, take a sample of water. We can analyze that sample of water for total nitrogen, total phosphorus, and we're actually doing soluble and insoluble. So we can use the sediment and filter the sediment and determine the amount of sediment that's running off from our, san our water samples and so on. Um, so if we look at the results then in the, in the P3 watershed, uh, this is um, mm. uh, from 2005 to 2010, they had 44 runoff events um, and the P3 watershed had uh, about 19% more water runoff than did the P4 watershed. So this is the one that we've got our living mulch planted into. Okay, but this is runoff data from prior to uh, the the um, incorporation of the P or the living mulch system. Uh, so then in 2015, uh, we had actually had a pretty active summer in terms of water runoff and, and rainfall. In October, uh, while well we had, I'm sorry, let me back up. Uh, in October, we had, um, uh, well, late September, early October, we had six weeks of just constant rainfall. So we had a lot of water runoff events. On Christmas Eve, we had five inches of rain on these watersheds and, uh, and so we can measure the water runoff on those. And um, basically, um, uh, well, we still had more water runoff from the P3 than we did in the P4 during these uh, uh, 27 uh, rainfall events. 
but the percentage of increase relative to the P4 watersheds now 5.1% compared to 19.5% before it was established to the P3 or to the uh, living mulch system. So we've reduced the amount of runoff uh, um, by having the living mulch system. If you look at uh, sediment loss, and uh, this is uh, 1972 to 1982, they had 36 events. Uh, and if you look at the amount of sediment loss, there was uh, 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 almost almost double the amount of sediment loss uh, in the P3 than there was in the P4. In 2015, and this where we had 27 rainfall events, we had 25 percent. Well, we had a 75 percent reduction in the amount of sediment loss using the the uh, living mulch system. So we're really encouraged by that, uh, you know, that we're not just reducing water runoff, but we're looking at the water quality as well, and the water quality is looking really good. Uh, nutrient losses here, uh, uh, not much difference between the P3 and the P4. Uh, we don't have historical data on that, but there's uh, P3 and P4 are not seeing much difference and no statistical difference. In fact, uh, when we look at, uh, this is roughly pounds per acre of nutrients that are lost. So not a whole lot coming off and that's, that's really nice to see. So this is a, a video that we took. The, the uh, video on the right is the um, living mulch system. And you can see how clear that water is. And the video on the left is our cereal rye cover crop. And, uh, you know, this is why we're so encouraged by the living mulch system from an environmental standpoint is that we're just controlling the, the sediment loss. There is some sediment in there. And, and if you look at it, uh, this is the sediment uh, that's coming off of the living mulch. This is the sediment that's coming off the cereal rye system. It's four different events that we're seeing this. This basically is all organic matter. This is all um, mineral so so nick just a real quick question <clears throat> in that system you had the the clover well the stover grazed off and a lot of the clover got grazed as well so basically the only thing the main thing slowing the water down is just the stolons is that correct well actually uh so that picture was taken um uh in a rainfall event that was in uh i want to say early december okay and, and what we're finding is that the clover, even seven days after, after uh, grazing, we graze it right to the ground. I mean, there's hardly anything out there, just the stolons. And in seven days, pow, that, that regrows from those stolons. And we basically have 100% cover on that system. So uh, I, think, I think I've even got some pictures here. Yeah, so here's what the clover looks like after <coughs> you can see little pieces of stover there. You don't see any leaves. That's the thing. They've removed all the leaves, which has got all the surface area that if the clover's underneath those leaves, that's going to be problematic. Okay, there it is. That's 14 days after regrowth right there. You can see it. here's a stover uh, a corn stalk standing up in among all the, the uh, clover. But there you just see how fast that clover regrows. It's absolutely beautiful. So here... Here's the cereal rye that we actually grazed this before we planted the cereal rye. Uh, and you can see we had weeds out there and you put the animals out there and they control the weeds. Here's our living mulch system. It's what it looks like after we've grazed it. And back here, we've just put the animals on. You know, January 6th, I took this picture with my phone. Here's the regrowth of the cereal rye here. Here's the clover, and basically, you know, we have a hundred percent stand of the clover. So it's really encouraging to to uh, uh, what we're seeing so far. We're really <laughs> the animal performance on this is something that also is pretty impressive. The animals were gaining; these are mature animals, and anybody who knows anything about animals, mature animals, it's hard to put weight on them. They gained 1.6 pounds a day grazing the living mulch system. And this is a period of the year where we don't have much forage available. So uh, that works out pretty nicely there. These guys lost about six tenths of a pound, uh, even though they were eating the stover leaves and 
and uh, getting nutrient from the from the weeds out there, uh, they lost weight. So that's kind of the system as it stands right now. So you know we have reduced water runoff, reduced sediment loss. Uh, the grazing was good method for controlling the weeds and and utilizing the stover. Uh, it happens at a period when we just don't have much available for animals that have growth capacity. And so we think this is going to be a really great system for the producers. And with that, I'll try and answer any questions. Yeah, I just wondering a couple things. Um, did you, probably Georgia was an issue, but soil temperature, did you look at prior to planting corn, any differences? And then uh, in terms of wheat, uh, insects, was there any changes in insect population, cutworms or anything? Okay, so... Uh, the ground that we planted this into uh, um, at both locations were corn naive. Uh, there had not been corn grown at either one of these locations for some period of time. So no, cutworms were not a problem, although there's some speculation, you know, uh, cutworms really, really like white clover. Um, and so we've done a little bit of digging around looking for uh, grubs uh, you know, cutworm grubs, which are also, uh, um, well, they're, they're, we didn't see any, let me put it that way. Um, uh, the, the hypothesis that the entomologists had here was that the, the clover would just be a great habitat for cutworms, so consequently we were going to increase the problem. We haven't seen that yet. Uh, we have some fields that are four years into production now, and we're still not seeing it. We do use uh, Gen 3 uh, uh, Roundup Ready GMO corn. Um, so it's got the triple stack of the BT genes in it to control insects. And I believe, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that's supposed to cut control cutworms as well. What uh Okay, corn do you guys grow? Uh, let's see. I've got the label right here. Hang tight. Um, uh, so it's a DeKalb uh, variety DKC64-69. It's Gen VT3P is the is the uh, uh, is the um, uh, technology that's in it. And here it says black layer is at 2,850 growing degree day units. So um, uh, I'm not sure how that would compare to what you guys have up there. Um, mm -hmm. um, I will say that this is uh, what is referred to as flex corn. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, flex corn is, is capable of responding to its environment. And that means that when the nutrients are available, it can capitalize on it. The non-flex mm -hmm. corn is what they're really pushing out in the Midwest, super high population densities. The size of the ear is fixed. And, um, and uh, you know, you just get your yield by really ramping up your population densities. I don't think that's a good strategy for Georgia for a variety of reasons, whether you're growing in a living mulch or not. I, it's just not a good strategy for us. Uh, if we grow on 20 inch rows, uh, uh, we, we get out of our rotation capabilities for other crops that we have down here in particular cotton. Um, if we grow, if we grow uh, real high population densities, uh, our soils down here don't have the high water holding capacity that they have in the Midwest. So consequently, you know, we're going to reach those periods where we get drought stress. Even if we're irrigating, we're going to have periods of drought stress. And so what I see happening is that uh, from what everybody tells me who's associated with Monsanto is that if you have any stress and these high population density non-flex corn varieties that they have, you're losing yield. And we just can't tolerate that down here. Somebody's got a baby up there. Yeah, we're family friendly here. <laughs>
Did you, try, did you try anything with suppressing the clover with like broadleaf, <coughs> diluted broadleaf herbicide? Or? Um, I haven't, but you know, the, the trick here for us uh, <coughs> is, is keeping that clover as healthy as we possibly can. And um, where we've suppressed it with Roundup, uh, which the clover is fairly tolerant of. We can go with a light application, you know, half a pound or three quarters of a pound the acre of Roundup, and it suppresses the clover, doesn't kill it. Um, if we do something like that, you know, uh, we lose the clover in between the corn. If we if we were to use a light application of a broadleaf herbicide, I think it would be even worse. Yeah. So knowing what you know about the environment up here in the Northeast, what are your thoughts? Uh, you have irrigation down there, which you obviously need. Um, what, you have a longer growing season. Um, where this, our systems here are silage oriented. What thoughts do you have? Well, um, you know, I think, well, let, let me ask you this. When you're harvesting for silage, what would be your date? Uh, that's a that's uh, you didn't intend that to be a joke but it's uh um it varies if somebody got it off in september when people get it off in september they're pretty happy and okay. it can be as late as what's the latest you guys typically i mean you don't want to take it off after october 20th but it happens sometimes what, when are you what's okay you? so um you know we're harvesting in September, middle of September, and our frost-free period goes from about the 5th of April till about the 14th of November. So we have two months of good growing conditions in the fall of the year for this clover to get reestablished in. And, uh, and I think that's the key, is that you need to have time for this clover to really get incorporated back and grow back on top of the soil surface uh, so you know um, I don't know if you can trick the corn to plant it earlier in the spring I know that uh, uh, newer corn varieties are a lot more cold tolerant than the old corn varieties are and that they germinate under cooler conditions and things like that but whether that would be enough to get you in earlier uh, to to permit yourself to have that regrowth potential in the fall, that, that would be the trick. Yeah, I, one of the other things I wonder about is uh, generally, depending on where you are, the yields aren't gonna be quite as high as what you were looking at uh, there. So I think on average, you'd probably have better sunlight penetration in a, one of our fields that might be heading for 17 to 20 ton corn as opposed to something that is closer to 30 plus ton if it were silage. Yeah. Um, uh, so what we found is that when we used uh, the lower population densities and higher population densities, that we still had um, pretty uniform light interception. You know, I figured that if we went down to 24,000 plants to the acre, that we would see a lot more light penetration, but that turned out not to be the case. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, I can't, I can't really speak to your conditions. I can only speak to my conditions here. I think it would be a guess, uh, for me to do so. And the last thing I want to do is mislead anybody. Sure. Right. Well, it's, it's interesting. Any other questions before he has a class coming up? I understand Jordy. Uh, you gave a lot of good information about nitrogen efficiency. What, how would you imagine managing the soil for PDK, pH, and so on in a system like that? Okay, so um, clover is a luxurious consumer of both potassium and phosphorus. And I think that's another benefit we haven't really looked at, the release of those nutrients at the time when the corn plant might need them. <laughs> but, but basically, the way I look at it is that you're trapping the nutrients at the soil surface by having the clover out there. So if you fertilize to maintain good clover, you're going to have plenty of phosphorus and potassium for the corn. And, you know, clover is a legume and it, it likes near neutral pH. All of our pH here is, you know, around six 
we try and keep it six to six five if we can. Um, six two is probably what we would consider to be ideal. Um, uh, so, you know, I mean, these fields that we're we're working with, they're all around six one, six two, um, and and you know, we just we just fertilize according to te soil test to keep phosphorus and potassium levels up. Uh, so that we have good, adequate nutrition for the clover. That's really our concern here is the clover. I mean, we're growing corn, but we really have to manage for the clover as much as anything. Do you have any farmers who are starting to adopt the system on a commercial farm? Um, well, you know, I'm pretty conservative when I go to making recommendations and uh, uh, you know, we've had one guy, uh, this, this guy he grows 10,000 acres of corn and soybeans, and, and he's got another 1,000 acres of pecans. And uh, he, pecans is a money crop down here, huge money crop. So he's buffered against economic loss. And he tried this on about a five-acre field just for the fun of it, and it didn't work for him. And it's basically because he didn't pay attention to the clover establishment protocols that we gave him. Um, um, but he's, you know, he's still encouraging, um, he's on the corn commission and they keep funding us. So, so long as, as long as I keep them happy, uh, you know, we continue to make progress, but, uh, you know, no, I'm not, I'm not going out and pushing this yet. Uh, right, right. We're just, you know, we're still, you know, clover establishment is kind of risky, and we just finished up an experiment, first year experiment, looking at herbicides to control weeds at the time of establishment. And um, uh, it looks very promising what we have, but at the same time, you know, I like to get data multiple years, multiple locations before I go promoting the, the project. So we're getting closer. We've made quantum leaps into uh, the technology. I'm not quite comfortable where. Uh, I'm ready to tell people go out there because I'd like to have a 90% success rate anyhow. And I'm, we're probably at about a 50% right now. All right. I'm curious if the, what the uh, <clears throat> growth habit of this clover is like. Is it more like a uh, Dutch white or a Ladino? Or how would yeah. It so this is, a, this is an ecotype of Dutch white clover. It's been selected for yield. Um, and the great thing about this clover, uh, down here we have a lot of leaf hoppers, and they transmit uh, various uh, uh, diseases. So clover, I think it's tomato, tomato spotted wilt virus that clover is, is very susceptible to. And leaf hoppers are a, a vector for that disease. And uh, because we have this ecotype, you know, I mean, it was selected out of lawns and roadsides and things like that. And Joe Bouton, who bred this, just selected for increased yield. And uh, so he's kept all the good traits about it from the standpoint of virus control and just increased yield. So it's not a Ladino. Um, it's basically a Dutch white clover that kind of acts like a Ladino. All right. Well, thank you, Nick, for your time. And I look okay. forward to seeing uh, what comes of this in the future. Okay, Dan. Thanks for having me. All right. Have a good afternoon.